Well, thanks for joining us. I know you've been in uh, in court this morning, uh, so a busy day for uh, for you as well. Uh, but we wanted to, to get your take on a couple of things. Um, so we do know that the uh, defense is getting ready to put on its case. The prosecution has rested uh, in the Sarah Boone trial. And uh, one of the, the reasons they said they are going to call Sarah Boone first is because they are using the battered spouse syndrome and uh, self-defense. And so can you talk to us about uh, what that is and what they basically have to prove to be able to, to use that as their uh, defense? Right, under the theory of defense, the burden of proof shifts to the defendant. Usually the state has to prove all the elements of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. But in this particular case, it's gonna be the defense job to convince a jury that there's a history of traumatic uh, domestic violence abuse. And there's case law in the past that recognizes that you, that you can use this defense, but the difference is, you know, reasonable is an imminent fear. So we have to convince a jury now that there, although there is no imminent fear at this particular moment, there is a history of traumatic abuse that led to Sarah Boone thinking in this particular moment that she had no other option. Uh, we heard from James Owens, who is representing Sarah Boone, saying that he typically likes to uh, call defendants to the stand last, if that is uh, uh, what he is, uh, if they are taking the stand. Can you talk to us about the, the strategy that goes into a defendant testifying on their own behalf? It, it's not something we see in every trial, uh, but can you just kind of walk us through uh, how that, you know, some of that decision making in, in whether or not to to testify and win? Well, the rule of thumb is typically for uh, criminal defense attorneys, we don't like our clients to testify because then you subject them to cross-examination by the state. Now, whether you put them first or you put them last, that's a decision that needs to be made. Ultimately, we can make recommendations to our clients, but our clients have the last word. A lot of times we want to be able to put you know, our client last. So it's one of the few things that, you know, that the, the jury is going to be able to listen to. Now, just because they put her last or they put her first, they can always recall her back and put her back on the stand. So they might, their strategy might be, let's put her here first. Let's bring the other expert testimony to come testify. And we can always bring her back, right? In case she gets cross-examined and she gets torn apart on the stand, let's bring her back to fix it. Uh, or let's bring her back at the end to kind of wrap up the whole case. But this type of cases, the jury wants to hear. Again, it's not something reasonable for somebody to be locked inside a suitcase and you're in imminent fear. And that's the, 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 the key in this type of cases. The question is, you got to convince the jury about the history of, of traumatic abuse because the element of imminent fear is not necessarily here in this case. And, and so we've we heard from the defense this morning saying uh, it as they were discussing some discovery issues, talking about body camera video and 911 calls from those uh, from prior incidents that law enforcement had been called uh, into uh, to incidents between George Torres and and Sarah Boone. So it sounds like you think that is where um, that that is the is that the key now, Jose, for the defense's case. All right, the key has to be they have to build a foundation of history of traumatic abuse. Because again, the, the state is going gonna, is gonna to hit hard on the fact that this gentleman or this victim is locked inside a, inside a suitcase. She, called her, she could have called 911. She could have walked out the door. There's a lot of things you have to do. Typically in self-defense, it's imminent fear, reasonable imminent fear right there at the moment. That's the reason you pulled out the gun. That's the reason you did what you did. Here, you know, if the burden is on, is on the defense. They need to prove that based on the history she has a different mindset that any other person in that courtroom or the jury does not have. So you have to convince the jury to get in her shoes, in her mindset, and that's why they're going to bring an expert to testify like to tell the jury. Although you might not understand that there was imminent fear at that particular moment, there is a history which causes her to think differently and see fear in a different, in a different uh, manner. Jose, let me ask you this. I know we talked about the the, the defense having to basically uh, show those elements to be able to to use the uh, battered spouse syndrome and self defense. What happens if Sarah Boone takes the stand and uh, they aren't able to uh, to kind of satisfy those elements and, and and prove that? Then what happens? Well, that's the key in this case, right? So they might come back with something lesser, like a manslaughter or, le or a lesser charge. But in order to get a not guilty verdict in this case, they have to convince the jury. And that's a high stake. You know, that's something that they have to do um, to be able to change the mindset, the thinking of the jury. That's a high task that they're going to have to do. And again, it's going to take some work from the defense and creativity. 
you know, it also depends on the expert witness. You know, it's the state going to tear apart the expert witness. You know, any other case law that they're going to, you know, they're going to move forward. All these 911 calls, all this history is going to come in. And again, a lot of times we see things in court that happen. You got to realize the defense attorneys have to preserve the record for appeal. So he's going to have to object to other things, try to get as much evidence in, because sometimes if, if the judge doesn't allow that evidence to come in, it could be a basis for an appeal. We always want to set up for the worst scenario, in this case being a guilty verdict. So we want to set up the record straight. We have to object to as much as we can and try to get as much evidence as we can that's going to help our client. I, I'm glad you brought that up because we have seen a lot of these uh, these things that, that have been um, been done, whether it's objections, whether it's uh, the the motion for uh, judgment of acquittal that was um, that was just denied a, a little bit ago. How much of this is done with that next step in mind? Basically, uh, in case uh, you know they do have to appeal, how much of this of, of what we see um, is is basically looking ahead to uh, an appeal? All of this is lawyering one on one, like the judgment of acquittal. You do it at every single case. Because what happens if you don't do it, then then the and this person gets convicted, they're going to come back and appeal and say the attorney didn't do this, the attorney didn't do that. So we want to what we want to do is preserve the record. Remember, if you don't object, right, uh, what you're doing is setting the record because you can only appeal on when you appeal something, you're appealing the decision of the judge. So you have to appeal, preserve what we call preserve the record. If you don't appeal, you're waiving the right to be able to appeal on that particular basis. So you're going to hear you know, objection, objection, objection. You know, you want to set the record. You want to get as many uh, uh, objections as you can to be able to come back later and appeal in the event that we get a guilty verdict. All right. Uh, well, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of interesting things there um, to to kind of break down. Um, so if you if, uh, if you're the the defense, then just kind of lay out uh, what your uh, line of questioning would be for for Sarah Boone uh, when she takes the stand this afternoon. Right, it's going to be very question, very you know, very tricky. But you got to put it on the stand. You got to set the stage. You got to take her mindset and put it in each of the uh, jury's uh, individual's mindset. You got, you want them to step in her shoes. You want to recreate what happened that day, how she was perceiving things, not how the, uh, you know, the, the body worn cameras or the state's going to perceive. The state's going to say she had an option. She could have walked out the door, but maybe you know she was under the influence. Um, her history, you know, so she's had a mindset that she had no other option, you know, uh, and that's the reason she didn't open it. And what would have happened if she opened that? Maybe he would have pulled out and strangled her and killed her, you know, and maybe she had was, you know, intoxicated to the point that, she, you know, she didn't, wasn't reasoning correctly, although that's not a legal defense. That's voluntary intoxication, right? But her mindset, her state of mind is what they need to put forth right now, take testimony and take her state of mind that particular day to justify her actions so that each, each person in the panel and understand why she did what she did. If they don't buy the story, they're gonna they're gonna adjudicate her guilty. Yeah, not uh, not a whole lot of. Uh, uh, it seems like it all kind of comes down to this, um, and so I would imagine from the prosecutor's standpoint, uh, they are have put a lot of, uh, I would imagine, preparation into their um, preparation for being able to cross examine her. Right, they're they're gonna they're gonna. I mean, it's 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 a prosecutor's dream to be able to cross examine any defendant. They're going to ask her, how much did you have to drink? What were you doing that day? Why didn't you walk out? You know, uh, why, why didn't you call 911? Did you not have a phone? They're going to lay out a lot of scenarios of what she could have done that particular day. You know, so they're going to rip her apart. They're going to, they're going to you know, give her, the, the idea is to prove that her state of mind is not credible and that she had other options. Uh, you know, again, she's over there drinking the night before with somebody who you feared. Where did that fear arise, right? So you're living with a person or you go on you know, trip, you see all this domestic violence and you start doing allegations from many years back or months back, but they still go on trips, you're still coming back home. You know, why? Where did you break off that fear? And when did that fear start that night that she had no other option but to open that suitcase? If this is your client, how do you prepare them for that cross-examination that is probably going to be pretty difficult, um, maybe even, even bordering hostile? We, we try to prepare our clients as much as we can. We set the scenario. I always get on the other side of the fence. I always play what we call devil's advocate. You know, I always think of the worst scenario. You know, if I was me, I would, you know, drill her, ask all kind of hard questions. You got to ask the hard questions. There's this thing that says, you know, as a lawyer, you should never ask the questions you don't know the answer to. So, but in her case, they're going to ask her, you know, how much did you have to drink? You're going to replay the whole scenario. You know, obviously there's always a little bit of dramatic, you know, she's going to get emotional on the stand. 
you know, but I would, I would, me personally, I would you know, we try not to have our clients take the stand. But you seem that this is a, a defendant who's had nine different attorneys. You know, she wants to run the show, and sometimes it can come back to bite them. You know, they don't have the experience. And I know I've had clients that are in custody for some time, and sometimes when you're in there, you lose the perception of the law, the perception of you know common sense. And sometimes, you know, she had an offer on this case. She didn't take the offer. So we'll see how what happens. And we'll see that if she's adjudicated guilty, the offer is not going to be as good, most likely. Can that be hard sometimes when you have a defendant who really wants to take the stand and you are advising them against it? Absolutely. You know, and in, in, in our field, usually when we have an, an offer for this, I hope this attorney has a has a has a letter. We usually write, make him write a letter and sign a release and say, "Hey, you've been given this offer. You know, if you go to trial and you lose, this is the maximum penalties." Even knowing that, this is our advice. Do you still want to proceed? Still want to? You know, you don't want to take the offer. And a lot of times, you know, they'll sign it and they'll keep moving forward. When we look at it, I always tell my clients is you got to put it on the scale. What's the risk? You know, I've had clients that are tell sometimes, you know, it's an eight year prison versus seven years probation. You know, so you got to took it. Now, when you look at a maximum 30 years and they're offering you 20 or 25, there's not much to lose. So you go to trial, you flip the coin. But sometimes, you know, you got to look at the risk versus the reward. But I can tell you a lot of times, sometimes when people are in custody for a long time, you know, they lose the perception of the law. There, there, there's too many people talking inside the jail, like we call jail lawyers. And they lose the perception of the trial. So the attorneys who are on the show. At the end of the day, we work for them. We'll do what they want. But if you say against our advice, you know, we document what it is to make sure it doesn't come back on appeal because you always hear this story later down the road. The attorney didn't do a good job or he didn't do what I tell him to do. And the judge, you will see at the end that the judge will ask her. Did your, did your attorney do everything that you wanted him to do? And then that's why a lot of times you see when you, know, you go through different attorneys, um, you know, we know the law, we know the process, so we try to guide our clients as best as possible. I'm sure the jury will be laser focused on Sarah Boone and her testimony and what she says, especially because of um, the kind of inconsistent stories that were given to investigators over the course of this investigation. Uh, those are all things that the jury saw yesterday, so I'm sure they will be laser focused in on what she's saying. But I'm also curious about um, the demeanor of a defendant on the stand and, and what we might see from Sarah Boone and how important that might be uh, to a, a jury. Do you think that's something that is, is important to them or that they, they pay attention to uh, when it comes to a defendant on the stand? And, and, and is that something that you tell your defendants if they are going to testify to be aware of? The key is, and I always tell you, you've got to see if she's a good witness or not a good one. You can have the best story in the courtroom, but if she's not a good witness or he's not a good witness, it could be a problem. So, yeah, the credit is also witnesses have to do with credibility. So the issue is credibility. They're going to tear apart her credibility, changing her story. So if you change her story, then you're going to hear the classic story. Why are we supposed to believe you now? Which one are you telling the truth now or you weren't telling the truth before? So credibility is a big issue, and I'm sure her attorney prepared her for those. I'm sure her attorney you know, gave her the right or, or, or you know, trained her, or I would say coach her, to be able to give the right answers to those questions. But those are going to be tough questions that she's going to have to address. And again, there's, certain, there's only so much you can prepare your client. At some point, the demeanor of how someone comes through, how they communicate their actions, their, their, you know, how they move their head, their hands, that's something that the jury is going to be looking at, and that all takes a play in the courtroom. All right, uh, Jose Rivas, criminal defense attorney. Uh, good stuff as always. We appreciate you joining us and, and taking time out of your busy day to, uh, to lend some of your perspective there. Uh, so we really appreciate you joining us uh, here on Fox 35 News Plus. Thank you. Pleasure to be here.